Welcome, welcome to Pog Talk again. I'm Crystal here in Think Tech. Uh, so, you know, in terms of pushing boundaries, I'm always trying to think of like, what are ways we push boundaries just normally? Um, and today I'd like to talk about identity and, and how cultural boundaries and gender boundaries kind of restrict us or inform us of who we think we are. And what is that process in terms of our creative work? And I have a very creative person here, actually an old friend of mine, um, who was actually my music composer for my film, uh, Blurring the Color Line. But but today we're going to be talking about Manman's work. And so let me introduce Manman. I'm going to do the official thing first, and then we'll do like the casual kind of like peeling layers off of what we know and don't know about you. Okay. So, and again, this topic today is on being trans. And we're going to talk about um, transgender, but also the transitions of of what it means to become, in the process of becoming something. You know, I always feel like performance is, is always a process of becoming. And when we're talking about music, how do we kind of go from the journey of where we think we are, what we want to create into that final product and, and why the process is so important. So um, today, really happy to have uh, Manman. And I call you Manman, but I know your official name is Yiman Manman Mui. And Manman is a taiku drummer artist, multidisciplinary artist, if you will, ex specifically. And um, my mom's done some really interesting things. And originally from Hong Kong, you lived in Hawaii for a little while, and now you're based in California. Maman strives to build an equitable landscape through the music as an educator, fostering creativity through multi-sensory expression. And the artistic approach challenges capitalist and elitist social norms. Uh, and there's something of a term that I think you need to unpack for me later called neurodivergence. And I hope we can look into that. Um, and what does that mean? And what is your relationship with music and body and just the process of, of becoming? So let's talk about that. Mama, welcome again to Think Tech. I know you've been here like quite a few years ago, but welcome again. Hi. <laughs> yes. Now, I really... Um, you know, the reason I keep thinking about you is because I first met you, you identified as female, correct? And no, well, at the time I knew you. Yeah, at the time I wasn't out. I wasn't, right. uh, you know, fully out using, like, being, identifying as trans and non-binary. Yeah. Um, I, well, but I, growing up, I know I, I never really fully identify as a girl or as woman. Like I know it, I knew it since I was a really young child. So, but it's only until recently that I have the language that being able to fully identify and share openly, this is who I am. And yeah, so when we met, that was not the, not what we talked about for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And I would mistakenly refer to you as a she, and I'm sorry for that. And sometimes I, you know, because it's in your mind, you have like this idea of a of an identity of a person, and then it's hard for me to transition. And and I totally respect the need to be aware of that. And so that's why I want to talk about transitions as kind of a theme for today. You know, what does it mean for me, even on my side, to transition my way of understanding? Um, so. Can we talk a little bit about your background? Like, you know, because you grew up in Hong Kong, quite traditional, you know, Chinese family. How does that all inform you of your, your you know, kind of identity? Well, yeah, I born and raised in Hong Kong. Um, I immigrated to the U.S. when I was 27. So, like, fully, like, fully immersed as, like, growing up in... It's interesting when you say traditional because when I think about Hong Kong being a you know, British being was a British colony. And myself now, these days I start using this term that I grew up as a British subject. <laughs> the colony oh, subject. Gosh, yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. I'm like actually this past 10 years living in the US helped me put in perspective and unpack a lot of what colonization has done to me. So so to to talk about growing up in a traditional Chinese culture, yes, I you know I grew up with families. We do rituals and things, and you know like bison, meaning like we would I would see my aunties and grandmothers doing full on like um traditional like Chinese traditional practice of like religions and like culture. But at the same time, my parents are, my dad especially, it's very open-minded. So, like, I 
feel like for me, I have the luxury of growing up. Like, yes, I'm exposed to very traditional gender norms. Uh, yeah. Very like, like that's the societal like how it imposed on like what a girl is supposed to be, a boy right. is supposed to be, that kind of thing. But at the same time, my dad, like it's encouraging me to be who I am. Um, so your dad knew that you kind of questioned your identity early on. No, I don't think any of us have the language. Like I, I, I think when I was really young, I did express to my parents a lot of times that I, I want to be a boy. Like I, I'm, I'm happy always being mistaken that I, I was a boy. Like because because of my, you know, the way I dress and appearance, and I'm always more drawn to um, boyish. Um, um, clothings and mm -hmm. and of course you know as a little girl people would also put me in dress and um mm -hmm. like right so but then with the culture of like where my my immediate family my parents like they never really put those expectation on me um which I appreciate but at the same time we didn't have the language to fully understand I mean I did like I remember being a teenager I, I mean, at the time, I have exposure to like, oh, lesbian, gay, um, but th that's it. Like, there's no in between. And I right. felt like, am I a lesbian? But I also am attracted to like my like, yeah, you know, like this exploring sexual desire as a teenager is really, oh, my gosh, what's going on? Right? But that's the thing about um, sexual desire as as a youth is that we tend to explore. Right. And it doesn't mean we're one thing right. or another, but that's part of the process. And and I need to also clarify, well, gender identity and sexual desire are two different things. And but then at the time, I did not have that. I did not have that available to me to understand gender identity and sexual desire are two different things. Okay, so sense. were you attracted to more girls than boys at that time? I'm attracted to both. I okay. was, I am and I was, um, yeah. which was confusing because at the time that, oh, I'm friends with people who are identified as lesbian, but I don't fully feel that I fit in with them. I'm, I dated boys, but then I also don't necessarily fit into that mode of, you know, people dating and and then how, like, as a girl needs to show up in relationship in a certain way. Right. Like, the roles never, women play. Yeah. As or, girl I never of. identify, never resonate with. And and looking back and, and also going through puberty, it was really hard. I experienced a lot of body dysphoria, meaning that I was really uncomfortable with the, how my body was changing um now it makes sense because like it also makes a lot of with like fat phobia too like i mm -hmm. i couldn't understand like i was really really discomfort had a lot of discomfort with my hips during the show and then my i talked to my mom and my mom would try to like you know like talk to me about like oh like you're exposed to all these media images uh it's unhealthy that's why you're thinking this way but now i'm understanding like okay it's also a mixture of like body dysphoria that I was experiencing. Yeah. And now looking back, having the language to understand it makes so much sense. What oh. gave you the language? Is it being in the States? Is it being in a certain community of friends who gave you that confidence and freedom to be able to trust these ways of, you know, confirming? I think yeah, with, with, well, moving, immigrating to the U.S., living in the U.S., um, being in the, I, I play taiko drums, which is my main um, uh, artistic expression and yeah. practice. And with that community, I'm I'm able to connect to a larger like queer community, uh, meeting friends who are also identify as trans and non-binary. And through that, that's how I start to like learn more. Um, oh, non-binary! I like this. Okay, in between space, this kind of right, yeah, yeah. I'm not a man. I'm not a woman. I like what am I? Um, okay, but can it, do you mind if I share that? You know, I went to your wedding, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> How long ago was that? 2017. Okay, and yep. and you know, you know, yes. 
you, you dressed yeah. as a, a nice, you know, you had a pretty, really pretty dress and jewelry and all that. Did you feel like at that time that you were going against what, how you wanted to be presented or you hadn't Always. transitioned to your mind? That's a, that's an interesting, interesting timing that you're asking me this because recently I look at photos. So yeah, from the wedding, yeah. um, like, you know, now, like when I look back, well, first of all, clothing has no gender and like anybody can wear any clothes because clothes itself doesn't have gender. Like it's, it's a society. We gender it. Right. 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 Gen- like, yeah. Like girls supposed to wear this men supposed to wear this. Right. Right. And, and now with the understanding that, and also after socially transition being out as trans, um, I mean, I, I, I'm also allowing myself to explore different clothings, like haircut and, but at the same time, I do like wearing dresses. Yeah. So, right. It's, it's comfortable. Yeah. I mean, I mean, there's all, there's certain type of dress I like more than the other. Um, yeah. but then like, when I look at the, the wedding photos, I, this is also inspired by friends that I like, I, I, I know, it's like looking at myself like, oh, if you like think of it this way, if you see a like a um a drag queen, right? Mm-hmm. Like, or if you see a person doing drag, or or think of me being a non-binary or more masculine, like I wrote more like I'm leaning more towards as trans masculine and a trans masculine person wearing the dress. Mm. Like, it could still be pretty, right? Right, absolutely. Um, yeah. So when I like, because I genuinely love the dress that I paid. Yeah, no, I remember <laughs> it. I love <laughs> the hair and the makeup. I mean, I wouldn't yeah. be wearing makeup every day, but I genuinely that was a nice experience. And but it's interesting because you come across, you know, because your your delicate Asian, you know. Yep. physique and all that so people don't question it um but when you talk about drag it's obvious that it's like you know a masculine body and a feminine dress and it becomes kind of a, a a contradiction or or people kind of have this discomfort or trying to like label so you kind of slip in this kind of this secret space of passing for whichever right. way right you know? and and to clarify though like now I'm able to see myself through that lens because uh-huh. like being able to come out, like having a community do see who I am and recognize who I am, that I am able to look at in the past and looking at myself being really feminine and be oh, be healing and oh, be like feeling it's okay. But it took a long time because no, like for a very long time growing up, I never ever wearing anything pink. I never... <laughs> wear any like I I don't like wearing dresses I remember a conversation I had with my cousin when I was really young like I don't like to wear a dress it's really uncomfortable but then I'm asking her why do you like to wear dresses (laughs) and I and yeah like as in you know like because of also realizing that it's I don't want to be identified I don't want people to see me as a woman I don't want people to see me as a girl but unfortunately, the society is kind of conditioned like, oh, you wear this. You're of course you're a woman. But like I'm like, no, I'm not. Like so, mm-hmm. so many layers. So do you feel like you have the pressure to poof? You know how Anna going back to something boring like academic talk of Judith Butler, who is famous for her um ideas on gender performativity, you know, she says, I don't even know, can I say she? You know, I I you know, they say um, the idea is that we're always performing a gender, right? That it's not natural. It's that sometimes it's dictated by these social norms that that dictate how we think we should be presenting ourselves in order to tell people what we are, right? So do you feel like you have any of those kind of consciousness when you dress every day? Or um, is it continuing to morph like as you continue to transition to kind of like just be in this fluid space of where you feel you want to be? How much does that dictate? I think it's transient. It's 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 continuing to evolve. evolve. Um, okay. I I certainly have a hard time parting with some of the clothing. <laughs> <laughs> like this dress is so soft. Like so here's my dream. Here's my dream is that 
I have this really pretty pink dress. Yeah. That is that I pay a lot of money for. <laughs> okay. I still cannot feel comfortable to wear it. Not all. even at like at a Barbie movie or something. <laughs> <laughs> oh, maybe I don't know. But um, and here's my dream: is that I want to perform in that dress. I okay. want to perform Taiko like uh, in that dress. That's something that I've been manifesting, like a piece or something. That all right? I'm going to hear you say that now, and I look forward to that performance because that'll be really. <laughs> but I'm glad you were talking about performance now because I want to kind of talk about your work and your music and how your being trans kind of affects, or can we use it as the metaphor, as you said earlier, um, into the process of creating your work and how that kind of how much does that affect the way your processing works does trans become a method of looking at fluid spaces that kind of connect body and sound and different types forms of music yeah i think it's interesting i've never really used it this way like being trans and how that i mean i am trans and i am non-binary and i am neurodiverse which you earlier asked me to unpack yeah here. yeah like so so now that i'm able to be more authentic with my own work as an artist um i i am like i am seeing that more coming forth like in both my teaching in both my composition in both my artistic creation yeah it does like show like being more and more coming to the forefront um first off i wanted to say that's kind of how like i first got really into taiko in the first place hmm. taiko drumming and it has evolved too so how i first got really into taiko drumming i started taiko in hong kong and taiko like i think to most people the immediate image of taiko is very masculine hmm. and and i like through playing i started taiko maybe 12 years ago um and that's when I'm like having that release. And mm -hmm. also as someone grew up, I I am autistic. I grew up uh, with selective mutism, meaning that when I was a child, I couldn't speak. Um, I couldn't speak at school. I only speak at home with my, with my parents and mm -hmm. my mama, my grandma that mm -hmm. used to take care of me, but I couldn't speak at all in school. And mm -hmm. So like being neurodiverse, meaning like how I, my, my brain is wired in a different way than how I relate to the world and not being able to speak is one way. I, and sometimes it's not necessarily not being able to speak. It's like speaking is not my most comfortable intuitive communication. It's a nonverbal communication. Right. And like taiko and dance and music, it's definitely like so much more in tune in line with how I mm. like to express and connect with other people. Interesting. And and Taiko being so loud, it fits so many needs for me, like mm. you know, defying that gender gender expectation, gender norm. And also being a small person, you can't see how big I am <laughs> tiny. And like playing Taiko. That's Taiko's what I want to say about your performance of Taiko. I love it. You are a tiny person, but you are such a loud, big person when you perform Taiko. You know, it's a beautiful thing. It's graceful and yet powerful. It's dynamic. Can we actually, sh this is a good time to share the video of you doing your Taiko. Does we have a small Yeah, clip? so to lead into that, okay. that it's come to the part where it has evolved, like for me. Like this particular piece that I included in a video to share is um, mm -hmm. with a really, really big drum. And the big drum we call Odaiko, which like, of course, a lot of people think of Odaiko, we think of like the hyper masculine image or people will think of like Kodo performance with the uh, fundoshi, which is like the, the, the smaller, the, like with almost naked, like you see like a very masculine body playing oh, okay. the drum. And I created this piece is actually where I, it's a space for me to explore what femininity is and what masculinity, or maybe what does that even mean? It's a place where I reconnected with femininity because growing up, I pushed femininity like, no, that's not me. But then at the same time, now embracing my own gender identity, like we all both, we all have feminine quality and masculine quality, like, but then the society kind of forced us to, you know, like 
compartmentalized, but yeah, yeah, we have to choose. We have to check a box. Yeah. Well, this is an excerpt. Like we can okay. take a look and well, let's take a look at it first and see, and then we can talk about it afterwards. Mom, and that was a little uh, clip of people just joining us later um, of your kind of, you said it was an exploration of gender through your taiko music. Can you expand on that a little bit more and how that kind of came to be? Yeah, so like I mentioned before, we watched a video that like a lot of times we associate with odaiko or taiko as hyper-masculine. And this piece was a space where we, well, I... At first, it was a solo piece, but then later on, I'm like, no, it needs to be a, a more than I need to play with other people. I needed that interaction and connection, nonverbal communication, and it's it's an improvisation piece because I it's a structural improvisation because it it's important to me that each time this piece is being play, played and being performed, it's 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 authentic. It's in the moment. It's it's derived from the the real time connection that happens and and for me like why that is like an exploration because for me to be playing in a very graceful way it, it took a lot it like now i play this piece with like at ease like uh like be like i feel really i for now when i play this i feel a lot of joy mm -hmm. um, but when I first started doing this sort of like um, more graceful way of playing and moving, it I, it was really difficult for me. Hmm. Plus, um, it's almost like it's in my body that I've learned to reject any sort of femininity, and and people see me like you said, right? An Asian fatigue women yeah. that's how right. people see me and these people are just associating me as such and such but i for years of trying to fight that off of me it's almost in my system in my body like no that's not me but having a space to like you know i can't move this way and it's actually natural for me to move this way and it's actually nourishing for me to move this way and also to move with other people that way and in the same video you saw my friend Chris uh Christy Akiyoshiro and David Wells and I love that in that particular performance the three of us have um sort of like represent a different stereotypical mm, <laughs> like, okay. case of like how people expect oh here's a black man like very like masculine and here is a more androgynous person and mm. And me, who seem a little bit more like I, a little bit like years, I'm like who seems maybe a little more feminine. <laughs> I'm even struggling to categorize myself in that. Too. Like, You're resisting okay. it, yeah. Right, but then for us to be doing this together, yeah, um, yeah. How that? Well, I think the key word is multi, multi. Like even in the beginning, you were struggling to say, okay, well, how do I? Which which words? I have so many titles under my belt. Which ones inform me, and I, what am I refusing to leave out? And I think the idea of multiple being a multi-sensorial way of knowing through Tycho, um, because I'm thinking about your three bodies working with each other, next to each other, and you're also in tune with listening to each other because you have to be sensitive enough to work with each other's dynamics right uh, and and if you have those if you will masculine and feminine um senses 
if you will. You know, I don't know. I don't want to compartmentalize as well, but at the same time, you are dealing with different dynamics. And I think that that's part of your process too, is how do you, how do you embrace these different ways of being? And how does that become a, how does the performance itself become a process? You know, like you say, it, it, it's really quite interesting. So how does music help transform people to understanding their bodies a little bit more? Is that, cause that's something you do in your workshops, right? Yes, very much so. Like it's, all about centering like you like arriving at your body that you are where you belong that mm. you are this is actually someone described my workshop recently i just taught in finland the very first thing that i did is breathe that we all breathe together we all like because taiko i think that's why it's really healing for me that i can be in my body i can be with my body and also feeling the resonance, the vibration. But even before I hit the drum, I need to be here, grounding, stand, standing on this ground, feeling my feet, feeling my chest, feeling every part of me. And it's the only time that I can feel that I'm fully alive, um, huh. that I that I am. And but then at the same time, I do want to emphasize that, like, not Taiko is not perfect. Like I still experience a lot of, you know, like people who look at me and, and expect a certain thing, but, and, but then, um, like at the same time, um, like I'm kind of running out of words. Well, how do you, uh, well, cause we only have a short minute left, but I'm wanting, I want you to leave our listeners thinking about, you know, how do we push boundaries? Um, because there were structural things that kind of keep us in a place um, just for the convenience of the way the system works, right? And right. many oftentimes we are meant to be in multiple places, right? Right. So how do we do that? For you as a Taiko artist and an educator, what are some suggestions to, to leave people with trying to find ways to push boundaries and to be in these multiple spaces? Like it's important to connect with the history it's important to connect with your ancestry with where you come from but at the same time keep asking is this am i showing up as who i am or am i trying to fit in mm. am I trying to fit into what people expect of me and sometimes it's never no one one way to answer that it's always keep changing and evolving but yeah. the process of asking the more of you and me will come through yeah. yeah, I think like, like, don't be afraid to explore and to express. Right. I mean, it's hard, easier said than done, but I feel like there's a lot to that. Um, I mean, unfortunately we are times up. I don't know how it went so fast, but, um, if people are interested in your work, your website, can you just leave us with your website? Yes. Um, I think, um, it was shown earlier. Okay. So, so we have it's it. my full name, Yiman, Yiman, Y-E-M-A-N-M-U-I, Yimanmui.com. And yeah, I have YouTube. I'm all over social media. You can check out yes. my work. Continue to push boundaries. Thank you so much for being on Think Tech and good luck with your new projects, your multi-sensorial, multidisciplinary <laughs> projects. Love it. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please click the like and subscribe button on YouTube. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Check out our website, thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.